morning. My name is Swami Arupeshananda, as Maharaj just said, and the title of today's talk is Tripuko Ghost Stories. And uh, I was asked to give this talk, or something like it, I should say, um, in honor of the 75th anniversary of this monastery, which was started on September 7th, 1949. So we're having a kind of ongoing observance of the 75th anniversary of the monastery. And so I thought I would talk about some of our spiritual heritage today. I, my own history in this place goes back to my very first 4th of July, 1969. Um, and I think it was, I guess it would be my third 4th of July, 1971. I'm told I got pushed into the fish pond by a, a, a big four-year-old girl and I fell and swam around in there. Uh, and through my childhood and adolescence, I came uh, on weekends, not just Fourth of Julys, but some weekends and some weekdays to spend time with the monks in the company of my father, sometimes more willingly than others. Dad sometimes had to drag his teenage son here. But he thought it was good for me to get exposed to these people. And I have to admit, in retrospect, I agree with him. Uh, and so... I got to see some of the lives here pretty close up from the 70s, 80s, 90s, until I joined this monastery myself. And so I'd like to talk about some of those lives because I am so very grateful that I got to meet and be influenced by these people who tried, sometimes more perfectly than others, to dedicate their lives to the teachings of Vedanta and to make the teachings of Vedanta manifest in their lives. That's why we come here to this monastery, is to do that. So I think probably the best place to start is at the top. And so, assuming you're going to behave here, let's see. Come on. Pay attention to me. This is a remote control. It's supposed to work. All right. Technical difficulties. There we go. Hi. Yeah, just sit anywhere. You can tell we're not quite ready to get started anyway. So, okay, there we go. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is a picture of the founder of this, not just this monastery, but this entire Vedanta Society of Southern California. His name is Swami Prabhavananda. Uh, I was fortunate enough to touch his feet before he left this world. I was only seven years old, uh, actually, when he passed away, July 4th, 1976. I was actually there that night when he died. Uh, and they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and I think it probably, this is a, a, a good one. There's a lot in this picture. Uh, take a good look at that face and the joy that, that comes off it. Nevertheless, I'm going to uh, read out to you something that our own Swami Yogeshananda wrote about this Swami, Prabhavananda. Just in case some of you don't know who that might be, I'm just going to show you. Why is this not paying attention to me? There we go. Okay, that's good. It's all happening. Okay. There's got to be a better angle here. Okay, there we go. He likes that better. Okay. Okay, so that is our uh, Swami Yogeshananda. He moved in here in 1949, and uh, he actually passed away here just recently at the age of 98. So these are his words about Swami Prabhavananda, the one I showed you just a second ago. And so there we go. He says, in Swami Prabhavananda's eyes and face, one very often saw the combination of deep inward joy and the shedding of light from that joy like a beam on everything encountered, which one sees in most of the photographs. I think that's a fairly good assessment. And I have to say, from my own experience, even at the age of seven years old, being in this man's presence was completely transporting. 
you felt like uh, as a little kid, I could say it was something like Disneyland and Christmas and Santa Claus and, and everything that you wanted as a little kid, a sense of joy and security. And it's really kind of hard to put it into words, but it was transporting. And you say, well, you're just a little kid. What do you know? Other people felt this way too. I'm going to read some more from Yogeshan onto here. He says, Sometimes one wondered if Swami Prabhavananda were even of this world. His immersion in Elsewhere, capital E, Elsewhere, was of longer duration and more manifest than most persons of spiritual eminence. That is quite a sentence coming from Swami Yogeshananda. Why? because he met so many pioneering swamis of this generation in this country. He met disciples of Swami Brahmananda. He met disciples of Holy Mother. He met a disciple of Vivekananda and spent extended and intimate time with them. So he is a man of some authority in this opinion. I'll read the sentence again. His immersion in elsewhere was of longer duration and more evident than in most persons of spiritual eminence. It was simply that he had practiced being absorbed in God until it had become natural and spontaneous. Yes, I would have to agree, and so had many others. And we might wonder, how did he get there? How he got there was meditation. And as the leader of this Vedanta Society of Southern California, he insisted really on just that one practice. I mean, you had to be, as a monastic anyway, you had to be celibate and sober. That's sort of the door charge to get into the monastery. But then after that, you were expected to meditate in the company of your brother monks for three hours a day minimum. Morning, an hour, hour at noon, hour at night. Everybody had to show up to the shrine and do that. The rest of the day, you were more or less given autonomy to a certain extent to contribute in a way that you felt meaningful and that you were particularly capable of. So if you were a painter, for example, one of the monks that I'm going to talk about today painted all the paintings in this room. He was trained as a painter. Um, others were men of letters. And they ran bookshops and translated books and wrote books. There were carpenters and plumbers and, and movie set designers, and they all contributed to their, in their capacity. But they had to do that one thing, show up to the shrine three hours a day, and for the rest of the day, try and think of God as much as you possibly could. That was the rule. Meditate three hours a day in the company of the brother monks and the nuns. And for the rest of the day, Try and think of God as much as you possibly could, whatever you were doing. <clears throat> and so, as you can maybe see from this picture, he had completely mastered his mind. And the result of this was, at least in my opinion, and the opinion of others, but my seven-year-old opinion, this was a kind of spiritual hurricane. You know, you meet someone and you think, gosh, is this person spiritual? Uh, you know, it seems like he's kind of poised or maybe he's in a good place or maybe he said something wise. This wasn't like that. This was like a spiritual truck hitting you at 50 miles an hour on the freeway and running you over. There was no question about the spirituality of this man. I'm going to quote Yogeshananda again. This is after his first interview with Swami P. Uh, in Hollywood. He says, as I rode back in the clattering old streetcar, this is Los Angeles in the 1940s, so there's streetcars. As I rode back in the clattering old streetcar, something physical happened. My throat was seized by an overwhelming, almost choking tickle. The sensation went on and on as if it were going to bore right through my neck. And as I remember it, the one thought that came to me was something like this. That is one powerful Swami. I've just met a tool in the hand of God. That was his thoughts. And this was by no means anomalous. This was what happened. You felt spirituality choking you to death. That's what you thought was happening. There was no question, oh, who is this guy or what is he coming? I mean, that was it. 
That was the experience that many people had. Not everyone, but most people did. And uh, <clears throat> this experience that Yogeshananda had was so common that Swami P actually used to carry Kleenex on him because people who got close enough to him would just suddenly start to cry. That's what happened to this man. This is Swami Tadatmananda, who was the abbot of the monastery when I came and joined here. Uh, he's the one who painted all the paintings in this room. As a 25-year-old Navy man, uh, he came and met Swami P and had an interview with him and couldn't say a word because he sobbed through the whole interview. Big, strong guy just out of the Navy. So I want to talk about him a little bit more before I get back to Swami P because, as I said, when I came here, he was the abbot. And for me, he was probably the perfect abbot, I think. Uh, the way this monastery was designed, the life you're supposed to lead here, was a kind of balance of the four yogas. So there's meditation time, there's karma yoga time, work time. Um, and in the meditation time, of course, there's devotional time, and then there's study time. So there's four yogas that you get to practice every day, and it's all run by a bell. And so Tadamananda had been living here for 40 years, probably-ish, by the time I got here. He had perfected this life. He had turned it into this ballet of, of balance. It was a sight to behold, and I was just so lost in admiration for what he was doing, and I tried in my own pathetic way to imitate it, um, which I slowly got better at, but I mean, it takes time to make something like that work. Uh, he would do the perfect amount of work. He would paint not just these things, but he would paint buildings. And he would do it in these little intervals so that after meditation, he'd paint for an hour. And then he'd go and do the next thing, meditation or whatever else. And slowly, over the period of months, the whole kitchen would be painted, the garage would be painted, and he would have these projects or a hedge that he would trim slowly in this kind of Zen fashion. He did a beautiful puja. When he worshipped at the shrine, his face just glowed. And the whole thing just, just looked, it just looked beautiful. And so I was blessed enough to actually uh, live with him for the last three months of his life in his room down there. He died in room three in the cottage. And I was there with him. His disease got upgraded several times. It started off as something called essential thrombocytosis. I think it went to multiple myeloma and eventually became leukemia and killed him. So by the time he's got maybe, I don't know, he's got like a few days left to live. Well, actually been going on for about three months. I was in the same room with him, living with him for about three months. And what happens at night is I wake up because you always have to take care of somebody when they're in, you know, they're in bad shape and you got to get up, take them to the bathroom or clean them up or whatever you have to do. And I would find him a lot of the time just sitting on the edge of his bed and looking up at this picture of Sri Ramakrishna and praying in the middle of the night. It would go on for a long time. Well, I was exhausted. I didn't feel like getting up and praying, so I would just roll over and go back to sleep. So that goes on for months, and now he's got just a few days left to live. And I find him on the edge of the bed looking up at the picture and praying in the middle of the night, and I roll over to go back to sleep, and I hear the bed creaking like he's falling out of the bed. So I jump out of bed, and I run over, and I break his fall. And I look in his eyes. I'm like this, this far away from his face, looking in his eyes, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, which you do a lot when you're taking care of people who are dying. I'm trying to figure out, what do I do now? And the nurse is gone. Doctor's gone. There's nobody in the room. I feel helpless. What do I do? This is a common experience when you're taking care of someone on the way out. And uh, so I, I looked at him and I asked him, is there, I don't know what I asked. Can I get you something, water, food, whatever? I don't remember. And, uh, you know, he looked at me. He was capable of expressing a lot without speaking. And uh, I, uh, he looked at me and somehow I knew it was the end. I thought, this is it. And so I started chanting, Jai Sri Ramakrishna. And I'm, like I said, I'm like this far away from his face. Jai Sri Ramakrishna. It didn't take long. Maybe two minutes of chanting. 
And then, and I've never had this experience before or since, but this wonderful thing happened. And I don't really know how to put it into words. But something came up out of him and went out the top of his head. I didn't see a ghost. But some kind of energy or something that you could perceive somehow went up and out. And when it got to his eyes, it was just maybe for a second, the expression on the face changed. And there was this moment of, of beauty. You know, I loved him anyway. And we were, you know, I don't, I can't say we were close because he was so much older than I was, but, but we got along well. And I felt like maybe we reached some kind of understanding by the time he died. But in that moment, in that moment, I felt like that understanding was just so much more than it ever had been. I felt like we were closer in that moment. And what I saw on his face was something like, well, there was love, there was sympathy, there was something like pity. There was. He looked at me and he thought, you know, kid, you got a long way to go, and, and I'm out of here. I mean, I, I got some of that, too. Which, okay, I can understand, because I didn't want him to go, and I know I got a long way to go, and, and okay, so we had that moment. Anyway, he left. And to me, what did I learn from this and why am I telling you this? What I got out of this is a line from the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita. Sri Krishna says, whatever a man remembers at the last, when he is leaving the body, will be realized by him in the hereafter. Because that will be what his mind has most constantly dwelt on during his life. I'm going to read that one more time. Whatever a man remembers at the last when he is leaving the body will be realized by him in the hereafter. Because that will be what his mind has most constantly dwelt on during his life. See, now you read that, okay, you read that in the book. And then you see the beautiful life. You actually see someone lead a beautiful life and then have a beautiful death right in front of your face. That is a different experience than just reading that line in the book. And that is why this monastery is here. That's why we join this monastery, is so that we can try and bring these scriptural teachings to life, to make them real and manifest in this world. That is why we're here. That's why the guys who are here today are here. They are trying to make this teaching or some teaching, whatever teaching, each one of us reflects this differently. But we are all trying to bring this spiritual truth to life, to make it real. Because when we do, we are a blessing not only to ourselves, but to the people around us. And so that is the lesson that I got from Swami Tadatmananda. And um, to, re, to join my story where I was a second ago, he had his meeting with Swami P., uh, and he sobbed right through it, couldn't get through it. And as I said, Swami P used to carry Kleenex on him because people would get next to him and just start crying for no reason. And as you can see in this picture, I think, yeah, we can see pretty well. He's sitting at the table. Uh, there's a coffee cup there. It's a meal table. And his face is just completely covered with tears. He's flooded with tears in this photograph. I don't know if you can all see that. This was a common occurrence. So it wasn't just that other people had this experience. He was living in this experience, and that experience was contagious. You got next to this, and it started happening to you. And again, another line from the Gita that I think this reflects. Sri Krishna says, On him let man meditate always, and the strength of this yoga faithfully followed. The mind is firm, and the heart so full, it hardly holds its love. The heart so full, it hardly holds its love. And this is what you saw with this man, that it would just spill over. And it was positively contagious. I'm going to read one more account that is also typical, and I'm not going to tell you the name of this guy because he's still alive. He's an ex-monk. He sent me this in an email probably within the last year anyway, long before I thought of this talk but it's fortuitous that I dug up an old email and found this. 
This is his story of a similar kind of experience with Swami P. He says, I went a little early to lunch one Sunday by about 15 minutes and found Swami P. sitting in his chair alone. I made pranams and he put his hand on my head and then I proceeded to the corner of the room and took a seat. By then I was aware that he could see into my mind like a glass case. So I didn't pester him with chit chat or questions. I knew that whatever I needed to hear he would tell me. As I sat there alone with him, I began to have a spiritual experience, a divine presence. And as it intensified, I felt myself so riveted that I could not speak if I wanted to. Nothing was said between us, but it was a profound experience of God within. It must have been ten minutes until one of the monastics came into the living room just prior to the lunch bell and looked at me knowingly. Because this wasn't that unusual. He looked at me knowingly and said hello. I could only nod. People began to come in and start talking. I am still riveted this experience, and thankfully no one spoke to me because, he doesn't say this, I am a basket case. <laughs> then the lunch bell rang, and I moved toward the end of the table where I wouldn't have to talk to anyone. After the prayer, Swami was served on his plate, and then he asked for a small plate. And he put a few morsels on it, and he handed it to the first person on his left and said, so-and-so, the person's name. One word, so-and-so. So this plate comes down this long table, hand over hand, until it reached me as prasad. Somehow I made it through the meal at the end of the table. So that was, like I say, a kind of typical um, experience with Swami P. And so what's the result of all this? The result of all this is that you want to do anything for this man. Uh, and he seldom actually asked for anything, but when he did, it was pretty scary. This next story I'm going to tell is about one of the monks who lived here, a sweet old man. Uh, he's an ex-monk. He lived here for about 11 years. His name was Buma, eventually. He started off as Cliff. Like so many other people, he felt so attracted to Swami P that, that he felt like the fillings in his teeth were going to get pulled out. At the same time, Swami P had this power around him where you felt like you couldn't really get too close without putting yourself in some kind of jeopardy. So you're doing this kind of balancing act. And the two of them are together. And Swami P says to Bhuma, he says, Cliff, that was his pre monastic name, Cliff, will you do me a favor? And of course, Cliff says, anything, Swami, I'll do anything for you. And he says, will you join the monastery? <laughs> well, now, uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah, uh, Swami, and so, you know, stumble, him, haw, all that. Um, Buma was a very charming guy, very extroverted guy, uh, had no interest in celibacy or monastic life or any of that. He thought Swami P was wonderful, but, as most people did, they weren't ready to move into the monastery. Nevertheless, he did. He did. And he stayed here for 11 years. And then what happened? He left. He couldn't make it. And he had struggles after that. He went through some dark times. He drank too much, and he overcame it. And he, and he turned into, after his dark period, he turned into one of the happiest people that I think I've ever met in my life. Buma was enthusiastic about everyone and everything that they did. And it was genuine. It wasn't forced. Uh, he just appreciated you, and he appreciated the things that you appreciated. And the lesson I got from Buma was that there is no failure in spiritual life. You know, there's dark periods. You join the monastery, and then 11 years later, not, it's worse than a divorce leaving. Because you got nothing on your resume. Not only do you have no money when you leave, but you got no resume either. You've been washing dishes for 11 years. So what are you going to do when you get out? So you, how are you going to find a job? So it's devastating to leave, I think. I mean, I've never been married, but it seems to me, on paper anyway, that it'd be worse than getting divorced because you have no world experience. Anyway, he recovered, and he became this beautiful guy. And that's the lesson that I got, that even though it does get dark, we do struggle in spiritual life. 
There is no failure in spiritual life. As long as you are struggling, you are progressing, even though it doesn't always seem like it. Anyway, so that is Buma. Now let's see, who's next here? Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> I've done uh, pretty much everything I can to open my mouth as wide as I can and spread my arms as wide as I can and tell you just how great this man was. And I want to tell you that he's not my guru, which makes it okay for me to talk about him like this because I'm not promoting myself. You know, we brag about our gurus. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's annoying. <laughs> but anyway, when I was seven years old, as I said, he passed away. And I was heartbroken. I wanted this man to be my guru so badly, I was just devastated when he died. And I wasn't the only one, but I was a depressed seven-year-old. I felt at the age of seven that I had nothing left to live for. I'm not kidding. I felt that way. I felt like this was never going to happen again. And my one big opportunity for spiritual growth was over. I'd missed the boat. I was born too late. And as I said, I was not alone in this opinion. Um, there was wait lists at this point to get initiated, and I'd made it onto one of the wait lists, and so had other people. And then he passed, and then there was this tremendous vacuum. And people looked around, and they started doing Swami comparisons. Various Swamis came through at the time. This one's not, and this one, and this one, and this one, and all these Swami comparisons, right? And... Uh, I suffered from this loss for decades. This tormented me for decades after this. And I want to tell you, because I think we've all done Swami comparisons, it's not very constructive. And I want to tell you how I managed to finally make peace with this. Uh, Asim, one of the monks who lived here, whose picture I... Do I have? I actually, well, it's an old picture, but it still counts. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, there he is. So if you can believe this, those of you who knew Asim, he's on the far left. He's about probably 25. So he lived here for over 50 years. Um, and actually, just next to him is Swami Yogeshananda, who's also probably about 25, maybe 30. So, and then Swami P is in the middle, and it's, this is taken right down the hill here. Um, next to them is Swami Anamananda. He lived, he lived here, but he also lit, went to other places. He passed away in 1993. I don't know the other person. I can't recognize him. Um, anyway, so Asim told me this story about going to the airport with Swami P to pick up Swami Madhavananda. Swami Madhavananda is in this picture um, on the right closest to the shrine. So Swami P is in the middle uh, to Swami P's left, the far right, our far right is Swami Nirvanananda. Madhavananda is the one closest to the shrine next to Swami P there on the right side of the picture. So Swami P goes to pick him up at the airport with a scene. And he tells Asim this, there's Madhavananda again, so you get a better look at him. He tells Asim this amazing thing about Madhavananda. He says, Swami Madhavananda is head and shoulders above me in spirituality. He says this thing. So Asim tells me this story, when I don't remember when, probably 20 years, well, he's been dead for 20 years, so he told me this a long time ago. Uh, he tells me this story, and I think, wow, what was that guy like? I mean, if you've got this Hurricane Swami, and the Hurricane Swami tells you, I mean, this guy must be like the Death Star, right? Just like blowing up planets or something. So I was just trying to stretch my mind to conceive of such a great presence. And so I kind of marveled at it and wondered about it for a few years. Asim dies, Swami Yogeshananda comes. 
Now, I know that Swami Yogeshananda has spent intimate time and extended time with Swami Madhavananda. And I thought, this is the guy to ask. What was it like to be with Swami Madhavananda? Because he understood Swami P. He got choked to death in the interview by this spiritual force. And so he would be able to tell me, what was the spiritual force like with Madhavananda? So I asked him this question. And he said, no, it was nothing like that. I didn't feel anything like that ever. None of that spiritual force was there. It was just a different kind of manifestation, more subtle. You just didn't have that. And this kind of it shocked me. But then I thought, oh yeah, of course, because Madhavananda was, was senior to Swami P, and he was also a disciple of Holy Mother. Swami P is a disciple of Maharaj. But a Holy Mother, many people just thought she was a nice lady. Holy Mother is, is considered to be an avatar, an incarnation of the Divine Mother in our tradition. So paramounts with Sri Ramakrishna sharing the throne, so to speak. And yet many people just thought she was just a nice lady with some, you know, a lot of common sense and, you know, kind, kind and, and you know, uh, concern for your welfare. But the idea that she was some spiritual giants, many, if not most people missed that. And so the lesson that I got from this is this whole my teacher, your teacher thing. And, and my guru is more spiritual than your guru. You know, it's just not that simple. Spirituality comes in all shapes and sizes. We have to be able to try and appreciate it in its different manifestations. Because it is one. This is the teaching that Vedanta gives us. Sri Ramakrishna says, there are three words that prick my flesh, guru, master, and father. There is one guru. There is one guru. And that is Satchitananda, he alone is the teacher. There is one teacher, not my guru, your guru. There is one teacher who manifests through all these channels to connect with us so that we can grow spiritually. That is the idea. So for me, this took, I mean, it's so simple. And yet to, have, to finally make peace with this problem took me probably more than 30 years. And I want to talk about someone who got this immediately, who'd never had a problem with this, and that is Swami Krishnananda, whose room was where the uh, office is now, just across from the library. So Swami K was, I don't think anybody would, would really debate this point. He was Swami P's number one disciple. I mean, I, that's my opinion, but I think it's a general consensus. He was most devoted. He spent the most time with him. He drove him everywhere. Uh, he was the charioteer, and he seemed to share in this capital E elsewhere that Swami P lived in. He seemed to also be tuned into that. He had his own kind of presence around him that I felt and admired. And so we might think that someone who is so devoted and so in love with Swami P would be most devastated when Swami P passed. You might think that. That's not what happened. What happened was just the opposite. All the other people, the people who are further away, who didn't have that intimate relationship with Swami P, so many of them suffered like I did, thinking that the world was imploding because Swami P passed and everything was going to come to a crashing halt. Swami Krishnananda never had this problem. When Swami Swahananda came and took over, he had the same devotion, the same love and reverence. I saw it myself when I was living in the monastery in San Diego, like in the late 80s. Swami Krishnananda was still driving Swami Swahananda and it was this beautiful thing to see his devotion to Swami Swahananda, and I marveled at it. And, perhaps most importantly, I didn't get it. Because I still suffered from this guru thing. I, could, I saw this, and yet I didn't understand what Krishnananda was really teaching me at that moment. What he was saying is that the devotion 
that he had for Swami P was not to a personality. It was to a principle. He was devoted to the principle of the guru. And that principle had just shifted manifestations and he did not miss it. He never missed it. He never had any of these problems that so many of the rest of us did have because of that teaching that he had made part of his life. That there is one guru. One guru. He demonstrated this for us. Some people got it. I know some people got it because I've talked to them about it. I wasn't one of them, at least not right away. It took me longer. I had to come here and, and go through a few other hoops before I finally figured out what Shrami Krishnananda was telling us to do by his example. And this, according to Vedanta, is really the way that you teach anyone anything, is you live the example yourself. And then other people, hopefully a little bit more uh, aware than I was, notice what you're doing. And then they try and make that example part of their lives. So you practice devotion to the one teacher. Other people who are smarter than me see that. And they think, he's doing it right. I'm going to try and do that too. And they try and make it part of their life. Again, that is why we have this monastery so that we can try and make these teachings our own, demonstrate them in our own lives, and be a blessing to ourselves and others. So that is Swami Krishnananda, and I want to talk a little bit more about him. Uh, this is a picture that was taken outside, obviously, it's outside the fish pond. Um, so that's Trabuco, 1951 or two. Uh, the only person I don't know in this picture, I never met, I should say, is bottom center, Ananta Chaitanya, he was the great white hope of Trabuco, I'm told, because I never met him. But he was, he was like the big guy. I mean, this is brand new. Trabuco is brand new. This is the first brahmachari ceremony here. And Ananta Chaitanya is, is brahmachari number one. He doesn't make it. He goes on a plane to India, falls in love with some Indian Rani, and never comes back. <laughs> That's it. The end of Ananta. Uh, on the left is Anamananda, I already mentioned him. On the right is Swami Krishnananda. Not considered a very promising candidate at this time. Later, as I said, became pretty much inarguably disciple number one. But in the beginning, he was none of that. Why? Well, he had what we would probably call now Tourette's syndrome. In 1951 or two, I don't think there was a Tourette's syndrome. But... He would have fits. He would jerk like this and blah, say things like Tourette's syndrome. And the irony of the universe is that his last name was Fitz. He was George Fitz. And he had fits. I always thought that was kind of just the universe had a cruel sense of humor sometimes. Anyway, so... I mean, he's actually, he's intelligent. He's a Harvard grad, and his family is New England aristocracy. But he's weird, and he's spastic and shouting. And so, you know, okay, he's, I guess his family's okay, but he's a little strange, and he doesn't seem that promising. The story goes, here in the shrine in Trabuco, he's in the shrine, everybody's meditating, and George Fitz is having his fits, and, you know, people are pretending not to notice, pretending that they're meditating when, in fact, they're wondering what's going on with this guy. Finally, Swami P turns around and shouts at him, Krishna, stop that. That was it. It was over. No more Tourette's after that. And uh, that's what I was told. Swami Krishna, I asked him towards the end of his life, uh, you know, did your parents ever accept, I mean, he, you know, he's from this wealthy aristocratic New England, Boston Brahmin type family. And he joins a Hindu monastery when in the, in the forties when it was just completely verboten to, you know, you, you didn't do that in nice society. I mean, these people were heathens, right? Uh, so I asked him if his parents ever accepted it. And he said, well, they, they understood what Swami P had done for me. And at that point they couldn't really, complain anymore because he didn't have Tourette's syndrome anymore. It was over. Anyway, why do I share this with you? Because we don't know our spiritual potential. 
That's the lesson here that I got from Swami Krishnananda. This guy was last in line, and he became number one. We don't know what's in us until we try. Until we try and get in touch with our own spirituality, we don't know what we can do. We have to set our minds to this practice to see how far we can develop. Because the Vedantic idea is that we all have this divinity within us. We all have it. It's just a question of manifesting it. And we have to try before we know. We can't think, oh, well, I've got this problem or that problem, because we don't know what we're capable of until we try and overcome these things. <clears throat> so that was Swami Krishnaranda. I'm running out of time here, but I'm going to try and get through the next one. Uh, I think I, yeah, I got that right. Whoops. Stop. Okay. Did I stop that? Okay. So this picture was taken in the library here in uh, early 1960s. So the only two people I don't know in this picture are uh, bottom left. His name is George Mongeus, I'm told. Um, I'm told he was completely crazy, violently so. And he once attacked Amrupananda with a shovel. And Amrupananda had to run for his life. Uh, and he, he was around for a few years. He went to some other monasteries. And anyway, I never met him, but that's what I was told. Uh, Ananta is next to him. I already talked about him. Uh, next to Ananta is Atma. He's still alive, so I'm not going to talk about him. He's 88 years old. He's living in Hollywood. Uh, next to him is Asim. Asim was just, uh, you know, I could spend an hour just talking about Asim. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say he was hilarious. He was one of the funniest human beings that I think I've ever met. And it got to the point, he told me, one time, sometime in his 50s, he woke up one day and everything just seemed funny. <laughs> That's what he said. It all just seemed funny. And, and you got that from him, that it just was funny. And, and he would have people coming here, they'd be in stitches with him. And it was so, I mean, you know, he wasn't a particularly, he didn't actually seem like he was that interested in spiritual life sometimes. But he was a, a wonderful guy to have here because he had such a beautiful heart and he made you feel so welcome and comfortable. I, I don't think anyone ever felt intimidated or unhappy with the scene. Uh, he was just loving and, and funny and entertaining. Um, above him was Anamananda. I already talked about him in the previous picture. Uh, going left from Anamananda's Ted Rents. Ted Rents didn't make it. Uh, fell in love, left. And nevertheless, I learned a lesson from Ted Rents that I'm, I'm going to tell you. He came here, um, he used to come periodically. He's gone now, of course, but I don't remember when this was, 20, 30 years ago. I was here, and he said, so by now you must have figured out that the shrine is your sex life. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. Um, I hadn't really thought of it that way. But yes, I mean, you're right, because we have this biological drive that we are trying to uh, sublimate, we say in Vedanta, we're trying to redirect this biological drive into a spiritual channel. And so yes, I mean, from that standpoint, it's just a rather earthy way of, of putting it. But I found that very helpful. And I would tell that to other people, the younger guys, sometimes they would come, I'd tell them that. And I, and I also added, and your recreational drug as well. Um, okay, next to him is Tadamananda. I already talked about him. Next to Tadamananda is Badrananda. Badrananda was um, born in England, child of a coal mining family. Uh, he desperately didn't want to be a coal miner. And he, uh, for some reason, he, he had this... Um, doubt that he was going to be able to join the army. I'm not sure what that was, but there was some question as to whether he really wanted to be a, in the army. That doesn't seem like it's that hard to do, but for some reason it was in his situation in England in the 1930s, I don't know what. But anyway, he did join the army. He's a medic. He fights in World War II, well, as a medic, and, uh, and he gets captured by the Japanese. And the first day, uh, first day, I don't know, maybe soon after they capture him, they're going to execute him. And they put his head on the chopping block. 
he is going to get his head cut off with a sword by a Japanese soldier. There's two of them there. And one Japanese soldier stops the other one because he sees the medic sign on the arm. He sees that Badranand is a medic. So he stops the other shoulder, soldier from cutting his head off. That's how close he came to death. Now, this man, as you might imagine, was unflappable. He was a Stoic among Stoics. I was probably about 10 years old, and one of the guys here had, uh, he was riding a tractor mower. I'm not going to tell you his name because he's alive. Uh, he was riding a tractor mower just outside the kitchen here. And he falls down the hill, that hill. He rolls down the hill, and the tractor mower rolls on top of him and breaks a lot of his ribs and bloodies his face, and he's a mess. And I run over there for some reason, I don't know why, and I can hear this tiny little help, help, because when your ribs are broken, I broke a rib, I don't know if you've ever broken a rib, you can't shout, because you feel like as soon as you shout, you're getting stabbed in the, in the abdomen. So he's got this help, help thing he's doing. And I somehow was over there, I ran over there and found him, and so then I run to Badrananda, 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 so-and-so's been run over by the tractor. And, and just, I mean, no change of expression, nothing. I think he was here in the kitchen. And we went down, and he looked, and he did, this was, you know, more than 40 years ago now, I don't remember the details, he probably called 911 or something. Then, after all that happened, and they took him away and did whatever they did, I don't remember, sewed him up at the hospital or something, we're at the lunch table, and Badrananda says, you know, when Lal Chand, that's what they used to call me Lal Chand. When Lal Chand came in here and told me that Roll, oh, <laughs> not supposed to say his name, pretend you didn't hear that, told me that so-and-so got run over by the tractor, uh, I thought he meant the DC-9. The DC-9 is that yellow hulk out there by the, uh, the farm. You know, it's, it's this giant yellow thing that looks like it's never moved. It did move. Up until 20 years ago, it worked. And then Amoananda left, and it stopped working. But uh, he thought, he said, I thought we were going to be able to slide Rolo. I did it again. <laughs> I thought we were going to be able to slide him under the door. He thought it was completely dead. He thought that, that this guy was killed. And yet, with all that, there was not a change of expression on his face. So I don't know if that's because he was in five years as a POW in a Japanese camp or not. But anyway, he was absolutely unflappable. He lived, uh, I was here the day he died. It was 2000 he died. Um, okay, and then top right there, I'm going to get to Nietzsche, the last. Okay, I've got a few minutes left. Top right is Eddie. That's another one that I could easily talk for an hour on. Um, I'm not going to. I lived with him for many years here. Uh, he, um, he's a beautiful man. A tragic, with some tragic flaws. Uh, he had wonderful devotion. He really did. And uh, he, he came to Swami P with a, for an interview when he was 19. And he had this question for the Swami. He said, you know, it seems like I'd like to find wisdom. I want wisdom. That's what Eddie said. But it seems like to get wisdom, you have to have experience. And to have experience, you have to get old. And so how can I have wisdom at 19? I mean, it seems like I have to get old first to be wise. And Swami P said, no, there's plenty of old fools out there. That's not how it works. And he said, why don't you go to Trabuco this weekend and think about it? And so Eddie spent the next seven years in Trabuco. He went for a weekend and didn't leave for seven years. So then after the end of seven years, you know, he's 19. I can make it personal. He was a virgin. And this was too much for him. He had to go out into the world and have an experience. So at this point, he's 26, and he can't take it anymore, to use one of his favorite phrases. And uh, it's his turn on Vespers. He's, you know, we, we do this, everybody rotates, shrine duty. It's his turn for shrine duty. And 
the rest of the guys are in there meditating, waiting for Eddie to show up. He doesn't come. And they wait and they wait and they wait and he doesn't come. Finally, somebody says, why don't you go to his room and find out what's happening? So I don't know, somebody did. And he wrote on the wall, big letters, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> and he went down the hill. He walked down the hill here, he told me, with $12 in his pocket, just trying to find a bus somewhere to escape, you know? Anyway, and then he did after, what? I guess 30 years after that, he came back. 1996, I remember he came back Christmas, 1996. And he turned into this beautiful guy. He had such devotion, and he, he would sing these songs that, frankly, I didn't really like, but he had a guitar, and, he would, and it was clear that there was devotion in his music. Some of them actually weren't that bad, but that wasn't really the point. The point was that he was, these were done out of love, and Eddie was a man of great heart. Um, anyway, so that's Eddie. He died just a few years ago um, in a nursing home in San Diego. Uh, the last one I want to get to is Nietzsche on the far left top. Nietzsche lived here for several years. He died in 2010. Um, beautiful guy. I loved this guy. I loved all these guys, really. But Nietzsche was wonderful, and I'm going to end with him uh, for a reason, because Nietzsche is a hope for all of us. Um, Nietzsche got uh, initiated by Swami P, I think, actually... He joined the monastery first and then got initiated, amazingly. That didn't happen very often. But he joined the monastery, then he got initiated, and Swami P giggled. Giggled through the whole initiation. He was in some kind of ecstatic state somehow when he initiated Nietzsche, and he had this giggle fit. And Nietzsche said the whole time there was this ha, 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 ha thing going on. Um, I don't know. I don't think Nietzsche knows what that was. I don't know if anybody knows what that was, but that's what happened. Anyway, so when I knew him, he was a lot of fun, very jolly, liked to sing a lot. You know, you'd talk to him and he'd sing and answer to you. Uh, and frequently dance when he sang. I mean, he was this kind of happy guy. Um, but then also he could be very caustic. He had a critical side, a sharp tongue. And you didn't want to get on the wrong side of it. So I, I appreciated him. And at the same time, I understood that uh, you had to be careful. So at this point, he's living in Hollywood. And I'm kind of, I'm living here. And I'm going back and forth. And he was this wonderful vent for me. I could go complain to Nietzsche. I'd go to Hollywood. And all the things that were bugging me in the monastery here, I could go complain to him about. And he'd be my sympathetic ear. Yes, there's things, I mean, there's nothing to complain about here, really, but you have complaints because there's an ego, and so we complain. And so I would go complain to Nietzsche. And I noticed that uh, it, it was, this was very rewarding for me <laughs> because <laughs> Nietzsche would listen to my complaints. And I thought, you know, he's, he's just such a fun friend to have. It's kind of weird he never goes into the shrine. I thought that was strange. Uh, you know, most, most of the monks do. Somebody actually asked him about that once, and he's, they said, well, don't you like your, in kind of a taunting way, they asked him, he said, well, don't you like your mantra? And he said, no, <laughs> which I, I, was puzzling to me. I thought, well, what, what are you doing here? But then at the same time, I couldn't deny that he was just this sweet big brother guy who had listened to my little grievances. So our relationship goes on like this for years. This is the last 18 years of his life. Um, and uh, I notice over the years that he's becoming less and less sympathetic to my complaints. And he's spending more and more time in the shrine. And I think this is odd. He never used to go to the shrine. Now he's going to the shrine, and he's not really that much fun to talk to anymore about these things that I want to talk to him about. Uh, he starts defending whatever it is that I'm attacking. As this person I don't like, well, this person's maybe like this or that, and you just haven't understood them. The situation I don't like, well, here's the advantage of that situation. I'm thinking, this is no fun anymore. I don't want to hear you take the other side of my argument. I just want events. And finally, it gets so frustrating to me that I just call him on it. I said, what is this? I used to be able to complain. And, 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 and by the way, you never went to the shrine, and now you do. And, and all this, I just let it all out. And so, how, what was his response? It was this amazing thing. 
He said, his answer to all these questions was, uh, one day, several years ago, I decided to stop complaining. Now, that's interesting, right? Because what most of us do, we don't want to complain either. And something comes up that we don't like, and what we do is we consider its merits. Is this thing worth complaining about? Is this a legitimate gripe that I have? Or should I not do this? This is what most of us do. And if it's a legitimate gripe, we'll go with it. And if it's not a legitimate gripe, then okay, we're going to try and stay positive or see the other side of this, whatever. He didn't do that anymore. That's kind of the normal thing that we do. He decided that his problem was not the thing that he was complaining about. His problem was complaining itself. It's a shift in perspective. Very simple, very difficult to implement. He had decided to categorically reject all complaining, regardless of the apparent merits of the complaints. That's what he decided to do. There will be no more complaining at all, period. In his mind, this is what he did. And so towards the end of his life, he's dying in a nursing home. And I'm a little bit over here, but I'm almost finished. He's dying in a nursing home at the end of his life. And he's just a miserable bag of bones. And I go in there to see him. And I said to him just one of the dumbest things I think I've ever said to anybody. I just could not. I was so unhappy I said this. I walked in, and without taking in the situation or considering anything, I said, hey, Nietzsche, how you doing? And then I looked at him. And I thought, my God, what have you said? Why did you ask that question? That was the worst question you possibly could have asked. Look at this man. Why would you say that? And then to my horror, I realize he's not just going to say, oh, fine. <laughs> he is going to actually consider the, the, the question seriously and answer it somehow. And so he looks down and he thinks about it for a long time. And I'm just on pins and needles thinking, what is he going to say? And he looks up at me and he says, you know, sometimes I feel pretty good. I just couldn't believe it. I just thought, my God, you've done it, Nietzsche. My salutations to you. You've actually done this thing that you set out to do 18 years ago. You don't complain anymore. Right up to the door of death. Now, I find this so helpful for so many reasons. Number one is maybe it isn't complaints. Maybe we're angry. Maybe we're jealous. Maybe it's desire. Whatever it is that we have, self-pity or, or self-condemnation or, or, you know, we, have, we all have our demons. But we have this pattern. Well, this thing that I'm angry about, is it a legitimate anger? Is this, a re is this, is this anger right? We consider the object of our anger in order to determine the answer to that question. What we want to do instead is realize that our enemy is not the object of our anger. The enemy is the anger itself. Translate that to all the rest of it. Desire, fear, jealousy, all of it. The problem is not external. The problem is the jealousy. It's the desire. It's the anger. It's the complaining. It's whatever it is. The problem is not out there. It is in our response to out there. That's the problem. That's what Nietzsche figured out. That's what he fought. That's what brought him back to the shrine. That's what changed him. And he started that at the age of 62. It is never too late to do this. I think that's just a tremendous lesson for all of us. It is never too late to start this. We can defeat our demons just like he did. And that, again, is why this monastery is such a blessing. It is because the people that live here are trying to implement these kinds of teachings so that we don't just read that in a book. You know, your problem isn't this, it's your anger. I mean, we've all read that, and some of these self-help books tell us this. To see someone do it, that's the difference. That's why we have this monastery. That's why this monastery is a blessing to this area. And that's why the lives that are, the people that come here and live these lives here, they do it so that they can make this spiritual practice a reality. And when they do that, at whatever age and whatever the practice, they become a blessing to themselves and to those who witness. And so I'm very grateful to this place, the lives that I've seen here, and, and I'm happy for this community that it has this place so that people can come here and try and leave, live these lives. 
Thank you. May the good Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. May good betide all. May happiness come to all. May all see the face of truth and be fortified with the armor of love, goodwill, joy, and understanding. Um, peace, peace, peace. <laughs>